Hi, welcome to the Geography of Industry lecture. My name is Leon Sultan. I'm an AP Human Geography teacher here at Abraham Lincoln High School in San Francisco, California. The Geography of Industry lecture is subtitled, Where Things Are Made and Why. So we're looking at where things are manufactured, where they're made, where they were made and manufactured, and what are the reasons that they are located where they are. Remember, this is geography, so location is very important. So we're going to start off by moving back in time to a geographer from Germany called uh, named Alfred, uh, Alfred Weber, and he came up with the theory of industrial location. So according to Weber's theory of industrial location, there are three factors that factory owners consider to minimize cost when deciding where to locate their factories. He called it the least cost theory, and he, he said that factory owners wish to minimize cost in three categories. The first category being transportation, the second category being labor, and the third category being agglomeration. So let's take a look at all three of these categories a little bit more. Now in Weber's time, we're talking about transportation in the form of primarily trains. Later on, cars and trucks become more of a factor, but when he's writing this theory, trains are very, very important. Okay, the second um, cost here is labor. Now again, this is very different than today because back then, there were not the same type of child labor laws and wages were pretty low, especially because unionization had not taken over, um, especially in North America or Western Europe. Now finally, we're looking at agglomeration, and this is a picture of the Ford Motor Works where we can see many, many different types of industries that are all built to support the auto industry all clustered together. So agglomeration is really clustering of similar type of firms. Okay, furthermore, we're going to dive deeper into one of the three factors, transportation. Now, according to Weber, there were two types, two major types of industries where transportation played a major factor. We have bulk or weight gaining industries and then bulk or weight losing industries. Let's figure out what these two types mean by looking at some examples. So paper, how is paper made? Paper is made with trees. Trees weigh a lot. Paper weighs a lot less than a tree, so therefore that is considered a bulk or weight losing industry. How about cars? Cars weigh a lot when they're finally produced. The individual parts do not weigh as much, so therefore the cars are classified as a bulk or weight gaining industry. In which type of industry are transportation costs high before production? That's the type of industry in which the raw materials are very, very heavy. So that's what we call a bulk or weight losing industry. In which type of industry are transportation costs high after production? That's where the final product is a lot heavier than the parts that go into it. So that's a bulk weight gaining industry. So in a weight losing industry, transportation costs are high before production. In a bulk or weight gaining industry, transportation costs are high after production. So in a bulk or weight losing industry, which is more important, the location of the market or the location of the raw materials? In a bulk losing industry, the location of the raw materials is of utmost importance because those raw materials are heavy. So when you locate your factory, you need to locate your factory near the raw materials. And we can see the example of this in the United States with the steel industry, which is located in um, Western Pennsylvania, as well as uh, upper Midwest, um, what is now known as the Rust Belt. Okay, looking at a weight gaining industry, the location of the market or the location of the raw materials, which one decides more the location of this industry? Well, the location of the market is utmost importance in terms of a weight gaining industry. And an example of this would be Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola actually has high transportation costs after production, so therefore they locate Coca-Cola plants all over the world instead of exporting it from the United States. An example of this would be in Mexico, they have their own Coca-Cola bottling. It's very popular here, actually in the United States now, because they use raw cane sugar as opposed to corn syrup as we do with American Coke. Okay, so according to Weber, there are three factors to predict where industries are located. However, we know today that there's actually f f two more factors. So we're, we're going to talk about five key factors. Right? We're not going to get rid of Weber, but we are going to update him. So the modern update, transportation is still a factor, labor is still a factor, agglomeration is still important, but we're adding government policy and taxes and available infrastructure. So these two things are major in terms of predicting the location of industry today. So take a look at those five and we're going to apply them to a couple different industries as examples. So tech companies, this example that I'm showing here is Twitter, they're located here in San Francisco at 9th and Market. And why are they located here? What factors um, of the five that we just discussed are the most important? Well, the biggest factor here is agglomeration because this is the heart of 
Silicon Valley. This is the hearth of technology here in the United States. So they have many like-minded businesses. They have employees that they can choose from. And they have the available infrastructure. Now, they, Twitter did threaten to leave San Francisco a few years back, but the government decided to give them a large tax credit. And so they decided to stay because of government policy. Okay, what about the steel industry? What's the most important of the five factors? Well, clearly, as we mentioned before, transportation costs are the most important. So steel is generally located close to where you find the raw materials, the iron ore. How about call centers? The people who take your customer service calls and complaints when you dial up Comcast or Amazon. These are mostly located abroad. Now, there are some still here in the United States, but a lot of these jobs have been um, outsourced or offshored. The reason is labor costs, okay? So these exist in countries like the Philippines, Mexico, or India, where there are lower labor costs, the available infrastructure is there, and governments oftentimes create EPZs, SEZs, or free zones where the, the companies pay very little in taxes. How about shoes or clothes, the textile industry? Now, a lot of this stuff used to be made in the United States, and very little of it is anymore. So the biggest reason for that is labor costs. Labor costs are much lower in the semi-periphery and periphery, and many of these countries have set up government um, free zones, SEZs, EPZs, in order to make costs even lower, so removing any kind of taxes or tariffs. All right, what about cars? What is the biggest factor in terms of uh, producing cars and where we're going to locate our factories. So transportation is still a major factor here because cars are very heavy to transport. However, there are other factors available, um, like available infrastructure, government policy and taxes and labor. So if transportation is such a big factor, then we would predict that there would be Japanese car companies and German car companies located here in North America because our market is so large. So according to the prediction, is that true? And it is. We see this map produced by um, Toyota Motor Company that they have quite a few um, ma uh, factory locations here in North America, one in Canada, one in Mexico, and then a, t a bunch in the United States. And the reason that they're located in the southern part of the United States in what we call the Sun Belt region is because their labor costs are lower due to not having unions as well as lower state taxes. So, and available infrastructure. So, um, we can see the location of Toyota plants, and it's very similar with uh, Mercedes-Benz plants. We can see that they also have assembly plants down here in South Carolina, as well as in Georgia, and um, they are located down in the south, um, primarily because lower labor costs and favorable taxes. Here we see North American automaker plants and uh, many different brands. And we can see how there's a very, the, the cluster of the older area around Detroit, but then we see how a lot of the newer plants are being located down here in the Sun Belt region, as well as in Mexico. So shifting our focus to just general manufacturing in the United States, we can see where manufacturing occurs, and we can see that it's primarily here in the, the Rust Belt region, as well as the Sun Belt region. Here's another map, a little bit more recent from 2010. So there is still quite a bit of manufacturing here in the United States. So this demonstrates manufacturing production versus employment percentage change since the end of the most recent recession from 2012 into today. You see how our manufacturing output has grown very, very steadily the entire time. However, our jobs have grown much less. The output has 20% growth over the past six years, but jobs only a 5% growth. And we can see that that's backed up here with the um, percentage of uh, retail versus manufacturing employment, and we can see that there's much more retail employment these days. So we're having a, a big shift in our economy that's been ha taking place really over the past 40 years from a manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy. So if we're not making things anymore, we're still making high-tech things, but we're not making things by hand. We're making things by automation and robots. Where is everything else made then? So this brings us to our next topic, and our next topic is called the global division of labor. So global division of labor explains where a lot of manufacturing and production takes place. So we can see this map here shows us um, textile or apparel, and a lot of the manufacturing has been offshore or outsourced, some to Latin America, but a lot of it to Asia, Southeast Asia, um, South Asia, India, Bangladesh, China, um, Vietnam, Malaysia, etc. 
Additionally, a lot of our um, manufacturing has uh, been offshore to Mexico, and a big reason for that is because of the NAFTA trade agreement. So you can see is a, a partial list of global companies um, that manufacture in Mexico. Another example is shown here with iPod processing, where we have research and design happening in the United States as well as India, and then all of the production or manufacturing happening in Asia. This shows the breakdown and how the wealth is distributed and not distributed evenly. Um, a big portion of the breakdown for the cost of the iPod goes to Apple just for the um, research and design. All right, so this topic is called the global division of labor, and we're going to start with our definition. So what is the global division of labor? Well, basically put, global division of labor means research and design in the core. Then the plans are communicated to the periphery and the semi-periphery, and manufacturing takes place in the periphery and the semi-periphery. We're looking at two huge areas, especially for the United States, would be Latin America as well as Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. And then the finished products are shipped back for marketing and retail in the core. So this relationship is really what we describe as economic interdependence, where the core relies on the semi-periphery and periphery for labor, and the, la and the semi-periphery and periphery rely on the core for investment. So key features, the global division of labor would not exist without efficient and low-cost shipping. So we, here we see container ships coming into the bay, but we also need communication. So we have high-speed instantaneous communication readily available, we have international agreements, uh, such as NAFTA, and we have internationally agreed upon standards of currency. So these are some key features that allow the global division of labor to, to happen. So we have efficient and cheap shipping, shipping, telecommunications, internet and air travel, international trade agreements, and standardized currency exchange. Now the global division of labor has impacts that are felt globally. Let's take a look first at the core. So one big impact that we have here in the core is we have cheaper products. All the things that we consume, shoes, clothes, um, electronics, etc., that are made in the periphery and semi-periphery are a lot cheaper because labor costs. We have deindustrialization. So a lot of these old factories, especially in the Rust Belt region of, the, of this country, um, have been shuttered. And here's an example of one of them in Detroit. We have economic restructuring. So as we looked at earlier, uh, this is a graph from Bureau of Labor Statistics on the 538 website. Retail jobs are increasing. Manufacturing jobs are decreasing. We are shifting from a uh, manufacturing to a service-based economy. Another major impact that we feel here in the United States is internal migration. People migrating from the Rust Belt region, from the um, upper northeast and uh, midwest area, to the Sun Belt and to the West. So this is an internal migration pattern. Those are some major effects in the core. Now looking at major effects in the, of the global division of labor on the semi-periphery and periphery, there's number one effect is absolutely an increase in factory jobs. Here you see Foxconn, that is a, a huge um, company in China that manufactures uh, the iPhone. So addition in addition to these jobs, we have a lot of rural to urban migration. So some of the people who migrate obtain these jobs, but others don't. And then that also leads into the rise of why we have so many slums or um, informal squatter settlements in megacities of the global uh, periphery and semi-periphery. They also have economic restructuring as less people are engaged in agriculture and more people are engaged in manufacturing. Okay, we also have increased pollution. This is a picture of Beijing, and it's one of the most polluted cities in the world, and a lot of that has to do with industrial production. Uh, there's increase in child labor. Here's a picture of a factory in Bangladesh, and Bangladesh has repeatedly been cited for a country that does not enforce any type of child labor laws. Along with the bad comes the good. There's also increased wealth. So this shows us uh, GDP in Mexico, and we can see there's a really large increase in the 1990s and 2000s, and uh, many economists would um, credit NAFTA for that increased wealth in Mexico. But along with increased wealth, and China has a lot of increased wealth over the past 40 years as well, since the uh, implementation of the spe special economic zones that started in 1980, we can also see that there is an unequal distribution of wealth, and there's a heavy wealth concentration in China along the East Coast here, as well as the um, 
the cities of uh, Shanghai, Tianjin, and Beijing because this is where the industry is located. This is where manufacturing is. So that covered a lot of topics, and I hope that it answered our uh, key question, which is where things are made and why. And again, the title of the lecture is The Geography of Industry. My name is Leon Sultan. I'm a teacher of AP Human Geography at Abraham Lincoln High School in San Francisco. And don't forget to please leave comments at the bottom of the lecture, anything I got wrong or any questions that you still have, and to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much for listening.